Thank you all for being here with us today. My name is Ellen Lang. I'm a longtime board member and past president of the Holocaust Memorial Resource and Education Center of Florida. I'm currently co-chair of the leadership cabinet for our new Holocaust Museum for Hope and Humanity. A year ago, we engaged Ralph Applebaum's highly respected exhibit design firm to plan our permanent exhibit. Ralph suggested we introduce ourselves to Stephen Smith. Stephen Smith is the executive director of the USC Shoah Foundation. We had no idea what might develop. Our first meeting with Stephen and his team in LA sparked an immediate desire for our organizations to explore ways to work together in a profound and original way. Today, we are incredibly proud to announce our collaborative partnership with USC Shoah Foundation, the Institute for Visual History and Education. Good afternoon. My name is Jeffrey Miller, also a longtime board member and past president of the Holocaust Center. I am thrilled to co-chair the leadership cabinet for the new museum. Our mission of using the history and lessons of the Holocaust to build a just and caring community free of anti-Semitism and all forms of prejudice and bigotry aligns so beautifully with the mission of the USC Shoah Foundation, which is to develop empathy, understanding, and respect through testimony. Our collaborative efforts will allow us to create a truly spectacular, one-of-a-kind, artistic, cultural, and educational museum that focuses on survivor stories and the depth of the human spirit. This extraordinary partnership elevates our new Holocaust Museum for Hope and Humanity to a global stage. Now, please watch this short video to give you a hint of what is in store for our city beautiful and the vast numbers of visitors and tourists will attract for years to come. Good afternoon. My name is Pam Cancher, and it is my privilege to be the executive director of the Holocaust Center. From the beginning, we have been incredibly fortunate to have the very generous support of Mayor Dyer and the members of the Orlando City Council, as well as Mayor Demings and the Board of County Commissioners. I'm so appreciative that both mayors have joined us this afternoon. Please welcome Mayor Dyer. I'm not quick enough at unmuting myself. <laughs> as you know, downtown Orlando is the heartbeat of our great city and our great community, and it offers a unique and unrivaled space for our residents and guests to experience something special. So we're really excited about this partnership, and the partnership is important because the Holocaust Museum for Hope and Humanity will not only be an iconic symbol of hope, it'll be a place for future generations to gather and learn and be inspired. This will enable our city to take important steps in ensuring we grow and continue to be the most inclusive, kind, and caring community. Next, I'm pleased to introduce Mayor Demings. Thank you, Mayor Dyer. As Orange County Mayor and a family man with children and grandchildren, I'm often asked and often asked myself, what kind of world will our children and grandchildren inherit? This new partnership will be an enduring legacy towards shaping tomorrow's citizens and leaders. It will create a museum that will be a truly transformative experience, a museum that will touch hearts and change minds, a museum that will motivate every visitor, young and old, to emerge as a warrior committed to defeating injustice, hatred, and prejudice. Thank you for allowing me to participate in this wonderful event and partnership. Thank you, Mayor Demings and Mayor Dyer. And now it is my pleasure to introduce you to Dr. Stephen Smith, the Finzi Verbitti Executive Director of USC Shoah Foundation and UNESCO Chair on Genocide Education. Stephen is going to make some remarks and then we welcome you to put your questions in the Q&A and we'll do our best to answer as many as we are able. Stephen? 
Thank you, Pam, and thank you, Jeff and Ellen, for uh, uh, convening us today. And of course, thank you, Mayor Demings and Mayor Dyer, for being with us today and for your support for our community and, of course, for this project. Well, if we got to see the, um, the introductory video, um, I, it would have told us a little bit about the origins of the Shoah Foundation. And I'll just, for a minute, just spend some time telling you about that. In 1993, filmmaker Steven Spielberg was making the movie Schindler's List. And while he was on the set of the film, Holocaust survivor came to speak to him at Auschwitz, where she had returned um, to go and see the place where she had been incarcerated. And there she found the set of Schindler's List. And she was talking to Steven Spielberg on the set. Um, and uh, he was talking to her about the day she arrived at Auschwitz. And she said to him, Mr. Spielberg, I don't want to just tell you about this one day in my life. I want to tell you my whole story. And that's when he realized that there were thousands and thousands of survivors who had a story, a movie in their own lives that could be told, obviously. Not everyone could be turned into a feature film. And so he decided to create the Shoah Foundation so that every survivor that wants to tell their story could do so. And to this very day, right now at uh, 1.30, a survivor will be interviewed by the Shoah Foundation 25 years later. We have now amassed over 50,000 testimonies of Jewish survivors of the Holocaust and several thousand witnesses to genocide around the world, including the Armenian Genocide and Rwanda and others. The partnership that we're forming um, with the museum is um, a wonderful partnership because for the first time, I think ever, the voices of the survivors will be at the heart of a museum. In fact, the idea of this is that the testimonies of the Shoah Foundation will be the beating heart of this new museum in Orlando. You see, this is the first time in history that Holocaust that the survivors of any um, historical event are the authors of their own history. This is the first generation of people that have been able to amass thousands and thousands and thousands of stories. And this is the first time that history has not been written by just a, a few people, but written by tens of thousands of people. It's not possible to listen to every single Holocaust survivor testimony because for more than 50,000 that we have would take about 12 and a half years to watch from one end to the other, 365 days a year, 24 hours a day. And so nobody is going to watch all of the archive. But together in this museum, when thousands of people come through and each see a part of it, that entire wisdom, that entire story will be dispersed across our community in Orlando, it will also be dispersed across the world from all those visitors that come to Orlando and take those stories home with them. For a city that's well known for its theme parks and its entertainment, we're not building a museum for entertainment, we're building a museum for insight. What this museum will do, it will have a message of hope and humanity, which when one thinks about it is curious because there is very little to hope about when one thinks about the Holocaust. The fact that a civilized nation like Germany could descend into such uh, disastrous, horrific, genocidal chaos and murder and murder and murder actually doesn't lead to much hope, probably hopelessness and despair. The hope comes from what's in the stories of the survivors, because they uh, have actually um, been resilient and tenacious and have come back from that horrific time in their lives to be citizens of our world, to be educators, to teach the values that we want our children, uh, Mayor, to, that you mentioned about our future generations, um, to teach our children and to pass that message on to future generations. I think of the archive of the Show Foundation as like a archive of resistance. If you think about it, the Nazis wanted to murder every single Jew without trace and to wipe them off the face of this earth and their names and their heritage and their language and everything that they were and everything that they stood for. And yet they survived and they have the final word. And their word, although it is hard fought, is nevertheless hard fought hope because they give us the ability to move forward in our world. Because if they can survive and they can uh, share these values with us, then we can do likewise. Our partnership with the museum is absolutely thrilling because we're not only just going to be sharing stories with the museum, we're going to form a deep partnership which will stretch deep, not only across Orlando, but across the world with a very powerful educational message. 
Our hope is not only to tell the story of the Holocaust, but to highlight for future generations the importance of human rights, the importance of people being active in their community, so that when they come to the museum, they bring their own story, and when they leave, they leave with a sense of action and purpose and what they can do in the world. Because if we are going to make a world which is safer for future generations, we can only do that together. And that's what this museum and this partnership stands for. Thank you. Thank you so much, Stephen, and thank you so much for joining us today. Um, we have a question that's th that um, asks about that our Holocaust Center was started by a survivor and um, how survivors will be highlighted in our new museum. And, and Stephen, we've been talking so much about uh, the way that we're going to incorporate um, survivor testimony is the heartbeat of our museum. Would you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so um, I think the fact that this, the, the Holocaust Museum originally uh, in its current uh, form was um, started by a Holocaust survivor is very powerful. Um, I think, you know, we've, we sort of think about um, very often Holocaust museums as being a place where you go to see a timeline of history and where you have sort of artifacts that need to take you back into the uh, into the concentration camps and that sort of um, sort of very fabric idea of what a museum is. But actually, a museum is a place in which people's lives um, are you know a, a living museum is a place where people's lives are expressed. And I think this is what the the heritage of this museum is. That's how it started. You know, as Tess began to talk about her life and realize the importance of the educational mission of making this not just one person that was telling one story, but actually spreading that through the museum to the whole community. Now what we've got is a growth of that uh, mission to a much bigger museum, but also the growth of it in many, many stories. And so the archive will literally be at the heart of the museum, physically. All 55,000 testimonies will be in the museum. And it'll be um, a place where we anticipate uh, working with our museum designers, every testimony will get played in that museum every year. And uh, what a remarkable uh, feat that will be. Even if one uh, visitor doesn't see all of it, um, between all the visitors, they will get to see all of it. And you know, when, um, Pam, when Steven Spielberg started the, uh, the, the foundation, uh, many Holocaust survivors said, you know, I'm so excited, I've given my, my story to Mr. Spielberg, and now everyone's gonna hear my story. And for a while, I've been at the Show Foundation over a decade now, I was thinking, I wonder how we actually get to that point where every testimony is heard. And this is partly an answer to that. Um, every survivor and their families will know that that testimony will be heard in this museum every year, which will be remarkable. I, we are so looking forward to that. Another question, why did the Show Off Foundation choose Orlando as, a, as your partner? What, what made us unique? I'm sure that we were not the first um, Holocaust Museum to come to you to say, what can we do together? Let's build a museum together. Why did you say yes to us? Yeah, well, By actually, the way, we went there with a pipe dream. <laughs> There's also, I see another question about, is the foundation in partnership with other Holocaust museums? And I'll answer both together. Yeah. So the answer to that is yes. Um, in fact, we share the testimonies of the Shoah Foundation with any museum that wants to be able to um, tell the story. And if you think about it, for example, um, if you're, uh, let's say, in, in Illinois, uh, where we have a couple of thousand of testimonies, um, it's very meaningful to that museum at the, uh, in Skokie, Illinois, to have the testimonies of the Illinois Holocaust survivors at their location. And in some museums, like for example, in the Poland Museum in Warsaw, uh, the, the research room in the library has access to the uh, archive so that when researchers come in, they, they can you know, go and do their searches and they can look for it. But it's very different to this project where effectively um, the, the museum team here, which uh, Pam is leading, um, has, this, has approached the Show Foundation to say, can we build this museum around those stories? What I love about this and why the Show Foundation has readily embraced this um, is, is several fold, actually. The first one is this. 
very often Holocaust testimony is kind of used as the, the last thing you think of. So you put the timeline together, you tell the story of how the Nazis came to power and then what happened you know, during the Holocaust. And then effectively what you do, you fill in the gaps with bits of testimony. And, and this, the testimony becomes like a, a proof of, well, this is what Auschwitz was like, or this is what it was like to be in a ghetto. And it kind of, it explains and, and, and you know, elucidates the point. What this museum is doing, the Holocaust Museum of Hope and Humanity is doing, is building it from the story out. So now, actually, it's not about where, how do we use testimony to illustrate, it's the story itself. See, history is, is lived by human beings. It's actually never lived by a book or a video or a documentary. It's real human beings that go through history. It's just as we're unfolding history right now. But actually, interestingly, we rarely go to the source when we want to tell the story of human history. We go to documents, we go to archives. Think about that. Actually, it doesn't make any sense. Why don't we tell history through the people that lived it? And now we have this amazing ability in this digital age of collecting this content um, and having a new source for our museums. And I think what we'll see actually is not only this museum, but many others in future that are biography related where you have the ability to talk to the people that lived history, we will see many more museums. Uh, let's just call it living history museums where the story is told by those. A couple of other things about Orlando. Um, I've discovered talking to people in Orlando and mayors, I, I'm sure this doesn't include you, the people in Orlando go, huh, why Orlando? We're not the right place for this. Of course you're the right place for this. Anyway, this, is, this is a human story that belongs to our globe. You have more people coming in and out of your city than probably anywhere else. And people who are there for fun and entertainment very often, um, but also people are there to explore and they've got time to explore. And hopefully they will come and explore this museum and we're going to make it attractive enough and compelling enough that we want many of them to do so. But Orlando itself is a melting pot of different communities and people that came into that city. It, it is representative of our country in so many different ways. And so essentially what you're doing, you're not telling a local story. You're telling a national and a global story in your city. Um, I, will tell, I will share with you that when uh, our founder, Steven Spielberg, learned about the project, he was also delighted because, of course, he's involved in the, um, in the entertainment and the theme parks as a, as a business person. The thought that uh, the archive and this museum would be growing out of that same, um, uh, you know, growing in the same place and available to the same people was just thrilling to him. And I think it's uh, wonderful that uh, uh, we're seeing that kind of partnership uh, emerge. Thank you, Stephen. We have a question specifically about when the construction on our museum is anticipated to start and when the museum will open. Um, right now, our estimated uh, timeline for beginning construction is the, the first quarter of 2022 and um, opening sometime in 2024. Now, it's estimate, and that is assuming that everything goes according to plan, which of course we know never happens. So, um, so stay tuned. We will continue to bring you more updates as we move forward. Um, Stephen, there have recently been some studies released on the impact and efficacy of Holocaust education. Uh, would you please talk to that? You, you recently wrote a, a wonderful article in the foreword. And um, so I, I'd love for you to share um, the, the impact of Holocaust education on students. Yeah, so the study which was produced by the Claims Conference, which is the organization which supports Holocaust survivors, um, it was set up in the 1950s in order to provide restitution to Holocaust survivors, um, does a, a variety of different types of work, um, including educational work, um, and supports educational organizations. And so they did a survey to see um, what the state of affairs was. Um, the survey, I think, was a little uh, misleading and a little narrow, I have to say, um, because what it did, it focused on the deficiencies and, um, and you know, particularly the headlines that came out, you know, demonstrated that whatever, 22% of millennials didn't have sufficient, what we might deem as sufficient knowledge about the Holocaust. 
And what's problematic about that is, of course, we don't know what their levels of knowledge are about Hiroshima, Nagasaki, or slavery in America, or Native Americans, or anything else. So there wasn't enough comparative data for us to know. And the implication is of that. If they don't know, then there's some, there's some willful negligence associated or willful ignorance associated to it. And actually, it just may be that we're just not doing a good job in our education system of providing knowledge. But the question is, what is the purpose of uh, teaching about the Holocaust and genocide and human rights in the first place? Actually, I don't know that it is for them to know that the final solution, you know, was uh, inked in the Vansay Conference House in Berlin in January 1942. They don't need to know that in order to know what the consequences and the meaning of the Holocaust are, or to actually imply, um, um, imbue it in their own lives. Interestingly, uh, another project called Echoes and Reflections um, did a study at the same time, and full disclosure, the Shoah Foundation is one of the partners of that, although the study was done by YouGov and was at arm's length from the organizations um, that support Echoes and Reflections, which is the Shoah Foundation, ADL, and uh, Yad Vashem, the Holocaust Museum in Jerusalem. That study um, was to look at the impact of Holocaust education on college students today. So actually all of the people that were interviewed were in four year, four year undergraduate classes um, and obviously most of them were aged 18 to 22. We found actually a very similar, um, a, a, on the knowledge side, a very similar outcome, about 80% of them um, knew about the Holocaust. Now, when you say the figure 20% didn't know, it sounds completely shocking, but actually the fact that 80% do know Actually, it's a really good result. And I think we have to focus on the 80% that do know rather than the 20% that don't, um, because we've got to close that gap on the 20%. And we would hope that 100% of people would know what the Holocaust was and what it means. But what we did find among the 80% that did know um, and had, had, had a fair amount of um, information about the Holocaust was that Holocaust educational had been transformational in their lives around attitudes and behaviors. And when compared to their peers, were much more readily, uh, much more aware of their role in society, much more willing to act, and even more interestingly, among that group, those that had include had had some form of Holocaust survivor either speak to them personally or some form of education with Holocaust survivor testimony showed even higher levels of empathy towards others. So what we actually got out of that study, and it's worth looking at the two together. Um, is that while they don't actually, uh, they're not op in opposition to each other, the one that looks at what's the outcome of Holocaust education, I think is most instructive for our project that we're talking about today, because we want our visitors to have those moments of transformation when they're in the museum, so that when they go out of the museum, they're much more willing and ready to act in our world. Thank you, Stephen. Um, I wanted to let everyone know that we did an announcement earlier today with um, many of our early investors and um, community leaders. And that full recording is on our website at www.holocaustedu.org. Um, a couple of other questions. Um, I've been asked to speak about um, the diversity of our donors to date. And we have been incredibly fortunate, um, as you heard earlier, um, Orange County, um, the Tourist Development um, Council had grants earlier last year that we have been a recipient of a $10 million county grant. Um, and of course, uh, the city of Orlando has uh, donated the land to us at a uh, dollar a year for the length of our lease. We also have incredible, very early investors, um, both board members, um, as well as other community leaders. And we will be posting um, an early list of our donors on our website as well. Stephen, do you have any questions that you are frequently asked by some of your donors as to um, your and our intentions, what we are doing with you, um, any of their curiosity um, regarding this project? Well, I think one of the things that um, has particularly emerged the Shoah Foundation's uh, donors and supporters, first of all, is 
um, a, a real excitement about this project. I think people um, outside of Orlando really understand that it is a hub in so many ways and, and, and represents so many uh, communities and, and points of view and, and therefore is you know, a, a really good place to build something so substantial. Um, I think they're also um, thrilled by the ambition of the project. Um, I, I would say that the Show Foundation um, would not be getting involved if the project was not so ambitious in terms of its scale and um, it's, you know, um, the, I think that the, the philosophy of the, both the aesthetics of the building and of the purpose of the educational outcomes, all of that um, is, is very, very well positioned. Um, I will say to you, as, as somebody who's worked in the field, Pam, um, for you know, the last 25 years or so, oh gosh, is it 30? Anyway, a while, um, that, um, you know, uh, I, I genuinely thought that small Holocaust centers um, in the early 21st century would start to, I want to use the word go away, but you know, that they would be not sustainable. Um, as it happens, by the way, I, just a, a little little story here for everybody on the call. I might be the only person that came to Orlando to see a Holocaust Center and not go to a theme park, which I did in 1993. I came to the museum um, that uh, is, you know, the uh, the original museum, um, and that was when I was building the UK Holocaust Center. And there were no there were no examples actually of small Holocaust museums uh, that I could go to in Europe, except for concentration camps. Um, so I obviously did that. Um, but I came to the United States to come and visit some of the, the, the Holocaust centers in the regions around the US. And in fact, I came to Maitland and I visited the center and um, it was part of, my, uh, part of my research into how does one go about building a relatively small but meaningful, impactful Holocaust museum. Um, and then I had a couple of hours free in the afternoon and I went to Disneyland on the way to the airport. However, um, what I thought would happen is that small centers like this one would eventually sort of, you know, when the survivors left us, the, the museum would, museums would lose some of their purpose and perhaps, you know, not sustain themselves. Quite the reverse is true. And, and I'm very happy to be wrong on this one, completely wrong on this, by the way. Um, I've seen this transformation take place in Dallas in the last couple of years, where a very similar sized Holocaust museum to the one that you have in Maitland actually um, has transformed itself into, you know, a $60 million project with, you know, hundreds of thousands of young people uh, coming through that museum. And I think what's really significant about this is that the Holocaust museums have really found their place as places that have the moral authority um, of the story of the Holocaust, but also the the purpose within our own society to speak to our societies about what we need to do to become um, I was going to say more tolerant. I don't like that word tolerant. We, 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 to be much more respectful, to be more open, to develop the critical thinking skills, and to be, really meet each other. Uh, places like this, um, where in fact the purpose is not only looking back, we need to know our history and we need to be able to look back into the past, but really to look forward and to put that history in front of us in the world today. And I think the, the team has put this together are absolutely correct to say, you know, if we make this about hope and humanity and we, we not only look back, but we look forward and we look forward with, with optimism and with hope and in every sense of the word, look forward to our future, um, then I think it finds its purpose and um, it, it will be successful. Thank you, Stephen. So far, we're talking about what we're planning to do for the new museum. Let's talk a little bit about what we're doing now together, because to me, that is, it is so exciting. We're, we're not just talking about building a museum together. We're talking about really incorporating testimony into our programming and really being a partner with you. So let's talk a little bit. We're, we're partnering with you all on a series we're doing in my own words, where we are bringing um, Holocaust survivor testimony to our community and beyond in this very virtual world. And we're also working on a citywide read with you around um, Mona Golubek's story. Would you talk a little bit about that? Yes, so, um, you know, testimony comes in many different forms. And, and I, what the Show Foundation is very keen to dispel is the idea that testimony is 
um, an elderly person sitting in their living room talking for three hours about what happened to them 75 years ago and then that's it and then it goes in the archive and it's done. That's actually a starting point for testimony. What we do is we then take that and we, 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 we find it in all sorts of different forms. Um, so one of the forms actually is, is uh, in the arts and um, we have a partnership with a uh, concert pianist, Mona Golubek. Mona's, uh, Mona Golubek's mother, Lisa Jura, uh, was 16 years old living in Vienna um, when the Nazis invaded in 1938 and took over um, Austria. Um, and her parents had a terrible Sophie's Choice kind of moment where they got one place on the kinder transport for their two daughters and had to make a choice. Um, they chose to send Lisa on the kinder transport to safety in England because she was learning piano. It meant well, she couldn't learn piano anymore in, in uh, Austria because that was forbidden, but also it looked like she might be able to sustain herself and find a way into a scholarship or some sort of education. So she went to England. In the end, actually, the other daughter was saved. So I'll, I'll, sorry if that's a spoiler for the project, but it, I want to make sure you know that. Um, but what Mona did um, was as she grew up and learned piano from her pianist mother and became a Steinway um, artist, she turned to telling her mother's story through music. And so what happens is these young people who actually may never, never have gone to a concert hall or never heard classical music um, come to these um, reads where literally the book about Lisa Jura is read by the young people and then they get to meet Mona and hear her playing a piano and part of her um, story of Lisa Jura which she tells and she acts as a one woman show. So obviously what's happened is due to the um, COVID pa pandemic is that uh, Mona had to postpone or cancel most of her uh, live performances. Um, and so what's happened is we've got together with her at the Show Foundation and we are helping her to tell her story digitally. And so we're getting together. And so the read that's going to take place, um, which will be available right across Florida actually now because it's digital, will not be for five or 10,000 students, but will be for hundreds of thousands, maybe more than that at the same time. And, and that's the sort of project that we can do together way before the museum opens in order to bring this wonderful content um, and educational material uh, right across our community. I think it will also help a lot of people um, across Florida that uh, this, this project's taking place and hopefully if they have these sorts of deep engagements uh, educationally will be much more uh, inclined to visit the physical mu museum when it opens. Well, we're, I'm very excited about that program. We brought Mona here back in 2005 or six, and it was, she did just a spectacular program. So we're, we're looking forward to being co-presenters with you. I wanna thank everyone for joining us today. Um, over the next several months, we will have many more exciting announcements and we will continue to keep you updated. A press release and a Q&A have been sent out to all of you should you have further questions. And we look forward to continuing to share more great news with you. Thank you for joining us.